Nelson, welcome to the show and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me on, Janelle. I appreciate it. So Nelson, as you know, I read your book this week and I thought it was fantastic. You you mentioned when we spoke a week or two ago that I would probably fly through it and I most certainly did. I sent you a message earlier in the week or last week of kind of one of the first paragraphs of the book, really the punch of the book. And I was like, holy crap, like that's how you get a hook into someone to read the rest of the book. So if you want to take a second to give everyone a little bit of the origin story and give everyone a sense of why you wrote a book and how you got to where you are in life. Sure. Yeah. So you mentioned my mom became pregnant with me when she was 15 years old. And while she was pregnant with me, her father, who was the local trash collector in a small town in Pennsylvania, drove into the town square. There, he spotted two police officers. He stuck a gun out the window and opened fire, killing one of the police officers, wounding the other. He was eventually captured and brought to stand trial where he was facing the death penalty. And during his trial, my mom got up and testified to the jury that the reason that her father had shot and killed the police officer was that that police officer had raped her. And she was now pregnant with his baby, who was me. And her testimony worked. The first trial ended in a hung jury. My grandfather was eventually tried again. The state did take the death penalty off the table because of my mom's testimony. My grandfather was eventually found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, where he ended up spending the rest of his life more than 40 years behind bars, leaving behind his family, which was quite large, 15 children, including my mom and now me in this small town of 6,000 people to deal with the consequences of what he had done. Yeah. And like I said, that's a lot to take in. Your mom is 15. I I knew a bit about your story, but even reading the first bit, I was like, oh, right. Nelson is the unborn child in this story right now. So Nelson, you were pretty scarred before you were even born with this story on you. Yeah. And, it, you know, fortunately for, for that part of it, I was young, so I didn't have to go through all that. But, you know, my life didn't get any easier. I'm born to a 15-year-old mother. Eventually, my mom does meet a man and uh, who eventually becomes my stepfather. Come to find out he's an alcoholic, very emotionally and physically abusive to me and my mom. And then they have four children in quick succession. And because of the lifestyle that they're living, a lot of the basic needs of my siblings fall upon me as the oldest. So I'm diaper changing, I'm bottle feeding, I'm even waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning to put crying babies back to sleep. And that's my life for the longest time. And I remember in the fourth grade, looking down, you know, the last day of school, you're excited. Who's my fifth grade teacher going to be? And am I going to be with my buddies and all that? And I remember looking down at my report card and my stomach just sinking, realizing that I had straight Fs and that I wouldn't be going on to fifth grade, that I had flunked the fourth grade. I had missed more than 40 days of school that year. Couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't spell. So it shouldn't have come to any surprise. The next year, they put me into special ed to try to get me the help that I needed. Come to find out I had dyslexia. So I'm struggling there. And then one day, my stepfather is walking home drunk from a bar. And there's somebody else driving home drunk from that bar. And they end up hitting and killing him. And it's at this time that my mom, no matter you know how hard she thinks at, about our situation and how many angles she comes at it with, she can't figure out how she's going to be able to care for all five of these children. You know, she's dropped out of school in the eighth grade. She's never worked outside of the home. And it's at this time that she decides that she's going to take her own life. And uh, fortunately, she's not successful. But, you know, when she does get out of the hospital, it's at that time that she determines that she's not going to be able to care for all of us. And that's when my family gets split up. And I go to live with my grandmother, who's the wife of the uh, man who shot and killed the police officer. And that's kind of the, the fork in the road for me when I go there, because there's no alcohol in the home. You know, there's no abuse. My gram is, you know, my biggest fan. From a very young age, she's always told me, Nelson, you're going to make something out of your life. And she really believed it. And so I started to really reflect upon where my life was heading now. I could be a kid for the first time in my life. 
I didn't have to worry about all these other things that I had to up to this point. And I started to uh, reflect where I was heading and I didn't like it. And one day a counselor came in from the local university and they started to talk about what you needed to do to get into college. And it was at that time that I'm like, geez, if I could get a college degree, the rest of my life would be easy. And you're a seventh grader at this point, right? I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm in seventh grade. And so, you know, you you know what happens whenever you tell yourself you're going to do something hard. That voice in the back of your head screams at you all the reasons you shouldn't even try it. And I remember thinking, Nelson, you can't read. You can't write. You can't spell. You're in special ed. Of my mom's 15 brothers and sisters, two had graduated from high school. None had ever gone to college. But I, I saw where I was headed. I didn't like it. So I figured I'd go for it. And the worst thing that could happen is I would fail and I, I would be no worse off. At least I tried. And so I did that. And, you know, 12 years after setting that first goal, four different universities, four years in the Air Force, I became that first person in my family to graduate from college. It's an amazing story, Nelson. When when I was reading your book and I realized you at eight years old was caring for three kids under four years old, that that blew my mind. I don't yeah. know, like I would not be able to take care of three kids right now, let alone being eight years old and bottle feeding and waking up with crying babies. How did you know how to do that? Did you just have an instinct like someone going to take care of these babies or did your mom lean on you? How did you know what to do? Yeah, I mean, you, you see your siblings, I mean, you, being hungry and you learn how to fix a bottle with whatever you had. And, and at this time of our lives, I mean, there wasn't always... You didn't have anything. Yeah, there was no formula in the house at, at all times and very little food. And, you know, it was the times where the electricity didn't turn on because we couldn't afford the light bill. And in my book, I talk about, you know, the heat getting turned off because we had no money to pay for the oil, the heat and having to use our kitchen stove to heat our kitchen and stay in there to try to stay warm. And so, yeah, it, it was a struggle. But I mean, there you have to do what you have to do at that time. And I just learned how to do it at a very early age. And, you know, I learned how to put bottles uh, on the stove to heat up. And I learned how to, you know, make sugar water if they were crying and throw a binky in their mouths and, you know, bring crying babies in the bed with you to try to get them to sleep. But it's just, it was just the way of life. It was the way that I thought life was. And, and I was just felt like I was doing my part and trying to take care of my siblings. Where was your mom in all of this? I mean, she was there. Yeah, yeah. she was there. Um, her, like I said, at, at this time of my mom's life with my stepfather, they were living a horrible lifestyle. There was a lot of alcohol and, and you know, it was not a great situation by any means. You're from a super small town, 6,000 people. I'm from a town of 13,000 people. So I know how you just have a name within a town and it's hard to get rid of that name. So the rest of the town knows your situation. Is there no help from the community or for a rest of family or people kind of just leave you to be? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think there was some help from my mom's family as far as like, you know, food or and my gram always came in and and, you know, helped out where she could. But a, a lot of it was, you know, behind closed doors. People aren't going to kind of publicly announce that. I mean, my mom was on welfare most of my childhood. So we were getting food stamps and, uh, you know, things like that. So, you know, just depending on what the food stamps got used for, you know, I remember going through checkout lines and you get food stamps, you could only buy food, but they gave you back change, you know, in real money if you bought something small. So we would go through the line, you know, take a $5 food stamp or a $10 food stamp, depending what store buy a pack of gum, which was legal. And then, you know, after that 25 cents, they'd give you back cash. And, you know, I'm not going to speculate where that cash went, but it didn't go for food. So, we, we can all you know, speculate where it went. Yeah, I, I know yeah. who it went to based on reading your book. Yeah. So there were a lot of things that, that happened like that. And that, I think that was a lot of the reasons there was not a lot of food in the house. And, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it was a rough, it was a rough existence. And Eventually, you know, uh, once my stepfather went out of the picture, it, it's a happy ending with my mom and, and my new stepfather and, and me going to live with my gram. So it all kind of worked its way out there when I was a kid. 
As a young kid, though, your stepfather took a lot of his aggression and problems out on you as a young kid and also your mom. So growing up, you saw a lot of abuse. Oh, yeah. I mean, almost almost every day. And, and it always coincided with alcohol. Of course. Uh, he was just an angry drunk. And I think a lot of it had to do with I wasn't his kid. You know, I was a stepchild. He didn't hit his other kids, did he? No, and they were young, so <clears throat> pretty messed up hitting a four year old. Yeah, yeah, and not not that I was exactly a man, you know. I was, I was, you know, six, eight, seven, eight nine, years yeah. old. Yeah, but my other brothers were, you know, infants when he died. I think uh, the oldest was four or five. So, oh, do they even remember? No, mm, no. Thank, I think the, I think my you. oldest. Yeah, my next brother remembers some things, but for the most part, yeah, no, no one remembers him. Mm, they. Blessing in disguise there for them. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Do you did you ever tell them all the stories? Do you, your mom share the stories with younger brothers? We have, you know, once I once I started writing the book and talking to my mom and getting some background on some of the stories and making sure that we remembered them the same way. I think some of it came up, and we never wanted to kind of rub that in their face. It's still their dad, it, you know. It's still their father. So I uh, never want to talk you know, openly bad about somebody's father. But uh, yeah, I think they, they got a sense of what kind of guy he was. Did your mom push back at all to you writing the book? Did she want all those stories coming up again? You know what? I think my mom was a little fearful. I think I'm just, you know, kind of peeling back the curtain on that life. You know, like I said, my mom's living a drastically different life now. She'll be the first one, though, to tell you she made a ton of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And, and that she's sorry for them. But I mean, you know, when we see people like that, let take a step back. She was 15 years old when she yeah. had a, had a child, you know, she was labeled in this town. She went to jail four or five times the year after the testimony because, really? why? You know, because the police targeted her for what she said. And so they would go and kick a garbage can over in front of her and arrest her for disorderly conduct. And what? she would- yeah, she would find herself in jail. So she, as hard as my life was, you know, here she is 15 years old. She's just done that. And uh, in this small town, you know, she's labeled and not only labeled, but targeted by the other police officers on the force for what she said. And, you know, it didn't end well for her, you know, with that. So she's dealing with that. She's dealing with a, an unstable childhood at her house, you know, with 15 mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. And what her father had been doing up till the time she was 15 or 16 mm -hmm. years old. So she had it rough. And the fact that she made it is, is probably a bigger miracle than the fact that I made it. So when I was young, yeah, I, I hated uh, a lot of the things that I had to deal with because of that. But, you know, as I became an adult and a parent and realized, you know, what she had been through and now she's an incredible mom. She'd do anything for her kids. Her grandchildren adore her, their great grandparents. And it, it's not where we start, it's where we end up. And I think that's a great life lesson. And in the life that she's lived, she could write a book and it, it would be a super inspiring story as well. I never ever got the sense that you had any hatred or resentment to your mom. It always seemed that you're a bit of her protector. You still loved her. You just understood that you were in, in certain shitty circumstances. And it always felt like both of you were still together as a unit, though. Yeah, and we were. I mean, even when I went to go live with my grandma, I mean, my mom never lived far away. In fact, probably two, three, four years into it, she ended up moving, you know, where I could see her house from my grandma's house. And she always supported me and my stepfather always supported me. So I was living with my grand, but she was still my mom. And no, I, like I said... I, I never want to resent anybody. I never want to carry around hate. It takes up too much space where good feelings can be and, and good things can be. And it, again, if I walked a mile in her shoes, would my life have been very much different? Would have I made any different choices? And, you know, the fact of the matter is, as rough as my life has been, would have I been able to succeed if my life was as rough as her life and in no circumstances? And you know, I got to go live with my grandmother and have that stable life. She never had that. And she had a kid at 15 and very abusive relationships throughout her life and dropped out of school in the eighth grade. And I'm going to judge somebody who had to go through that because they weren't the perfect parent early on. I, I would hope not. 
your mom has a lot of strength. Even when I was putting together the stories at the beginning and then the stories at the end that she told you right at the end, your mom was holding a lot on her shoulders at all times. And in your eyes, not keeping it together, but still keeping it together with the kind of the hand that she was dealt, you know? Yeah. And and she is. I mean, she's super strong, one of a kind person and yeah, tons of respect for her and and love. And like I said in my book, I mean, she's the true hero in this story. Mm -hmm. What I loved about reading your book is was the parallel. So you would keep switching back to you as a boy and now you as a parent of three sons. One of the stories that I loved, at, not lo loved, but it was just like a little comical and easy to see the innocence in you, even though you were still taking care of a lot of your family. But the story about the the heat bill and when the power company came to the door, if you don't mind sharing that story briefly, that, that was funny. It was really cute to see the innocence. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I talk about resourcefulness and I think that's one of the things that I learned in life is it's never a lack of resources. That's your problem. It's a lack of being resourceful. And one day my mom, you know, I'm, I'm living with my mom at this time and somebody knocks at the door and I'm excited, you know, I'm, I'm super young, but I go to the door and open it up because no one ever came to our house. So I was excited. I remember being excited and the guy was there and he had his name tag on his shirt and it said Bill and I was great that I could read it. And he asked for uh, Mitzi Tressler and I'm like, Mitzi Tressler? And he's like, yeah. And then my mom comes up behind me and asks what he's there for and they start a conversation and he asked for Mitzi and she says he's not there and I'm like yeah she is and so I run into the kitchen and I grab her thinking that these adults are going to be proud of me and I come in as my mom's trying to wrap up the conversation and asking when Mitzi is going to be back and she says a couple of days and I'm like no mom here she is and here I come with my Siamese cat in my arms and the guy at the door looks at me and then he looks up at my mom with a strange look on his face and she, and he says, you didn't do that, did you? And my mom's like, yeah, I did. And she shuts the door and the guy that was there was from the power company and he was there to collect on on paid bill. And because they won't turn your power back on until you pay your on paid bill, my mom had had the power bill in her name, my name, my brother's name. And she tried it with our Siamese cat, Mitzi, and uh, it worked. And and the guy was there to, to collect from Mitzi, but you know, Mitzi was the cat. And when I was I, reading the story, but I, I assumed it was your grandmother. And I thought you were going to get your grandmother in the chair or whatever. And then when I realized it was the cat, I was like, damn, this woman's good. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't know if you could get away with that nowadays. Never. But but she figured out a way to do it and to get heat. And it probably wasn't the most eth ethical thing to do or honest thing to do, but you got to work with what you have resourcefulness. Exactly. And that's what my mom had to do was she just, she just figured out a way to get it done. And I think I get that from her. I yes, think I would agree. figure out, Hey, you know what? It's not going to work this way. Let's, let's get creative. And I think that's one of my, you know, superpowers is just figuring a, out a way and I think, you know, we all need to be able to do that because when we come up to a hurdle, we have two choices. We can stop or we can grow and get over it and figure it out. And I think that's one of the things that my mom taught me. Definitely. And your mom is mid to late 20s at this point with a lot of kids. Oh, yeah. She's so I'm under 10. So she's under 25, 23. You got to admire her resourcefulness, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was, uh, and this is in was, the seventies, right? Uh, yeah. Early eighties. Yeah. 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 Probably seventies. Yeah. 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 You could get away with a lot more back then. Yeah. Good and bad. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, uh, the quotes in the book that was my favorite and I will quote, you said, we don't necessarily have to play the hand we were dealt just like in poker. We can discard the ones we don't want. There were winning hands out there, and all I had to do was ask for new cards. Talk to me about that. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I was born in a rough situation, and, and so were a lot of my family and my aunts and my uncles. And I think a lot of times because people are born in those hard situations, they think that they have to hold pat with that situation and just carry along, just like a, a poker game. You know, you get dealt a crappy hand of cards, you feel like you have to play that. But unlike 
poker in life, you get to discard those cards every time that you want something different. And I talk a lot about that because by discarding those cards, it's about making different choices. I truly believe you are exactly where you choose to be, good or bad. And because you are there, the great thing about being exactly where you choose to be is that you're in control. And if you want to be somewhere different, you get to change that. And the way that you change that is by making different choices or discarding that hand that you were dealt and getting another set of cards to play by making those different choices. And I think that was one of the things that I ended up doing when I was sitting there in seventh grade thinking about the direction that my life was heading. I could have said, you know what? I was dealt this hand of cards. No one would blame me. I mean, look where I came from. Look at my circumstances. No one would blame me if I just lived an ordinary life in that small town. In fact, they'd probably be amazed that I didn't end up in jail. But that's not what I wanted. I didn't want the hand that was dealt me. And so I started to make different choices and started to go after my dreams and, and you know, determined quickly after that that I didn't want to live just an average life. I wanted to live an extraordinary life. And in order to do that, you have to start making extraordinary choices. And thankfully, I, I learned how to do that in my life. But you didn't have a lot of good influences in your life, like in, in terms of your immediate family. So where do you get that drive and ambition? Yeah, I mean, I loved my family. I mean, uh, and I hope it didn't come off in the book that I didn't. But I also really, yeah, I, I also realized that that the lives and the lifestyles that they were living was not something that I wanted to live. I, I think contrast is one of those key things in our lives that we need some contrast. We need to see how things are different. And if I would have just stayed in that small little town and never been exposed to other families, I would have thought, you know, this is the way families are. It, it doesn't get any better than this. But fortunately, I, I got placed into the Big Brother, Big Sister program. And I got some contrast there with my big brother and, and his wife, Chuck and Mary Die account, who, you know, took me back to the Philadelphia area and showed me their family. And both of their families were just incredible people. And they treated each other different and they had different expectations and everybody was going to college and, and everybody was, you know, striving to, to be their best. And that opened my eyes. You know, I dated a girl in high school that her family kind of showed me that all dads don't come home drunk and beat on their families. So I had that contrast in my life. And when I saw those other opportunities on how you can live your life, I like those opportunities better and, and then started to strive to accomplish that in my own life. Do you think people who have poorer and tougher upbringings naturally have more drive and ambition? Absolutely. and and. That's the, the title of my book, The Unlucky Sperm Club. What, you know, you're born in a rough situation. I was going to call the book The Lucky Sperm Club. And you think about, mm -hmm. you know, that, that term comes along with like people's kids like Donald Trump's and, and the Kardashians and, mm -hmm. you know, Charlie Sheen, all, all these guys that are born into privilege. And then people look at them and say, of course, they're going to be successful. I mean, look, look at the conditions they were born in. But right. a lot of times what we find out is, that that's a harder upbringing. Comfort is harder to succeed than being stuck in hard circumstances. And I think, you know, if I didn't go through all the things that I had to go through as a child, I don't think I would have the drive to succeed. I, I don't think I would have that drive to become the best version of myself. I don't think I would have that drive to be the best husband I can be, the best father that I can be, because I know what it's like if you don't try to do those things. I know what it's like to have a bad father in the home. I know what it's like to have a bad husband in the home. And I didn't want that for my family. So because of that, I think that drive to uh, excel in, in these areas of, of my life are there. One of the terms that you use in your book that I loved is the crab mentality. If you want to speak to that. Yeah, I'm going through that right now. Yeah. Some of my family members don't like my book. And I knew that was going to be the case because <laughs> I've kind of opened up some of the things that, you know, happened there with our family. But yeah, there, many of the times when you are going to spread your wings and, and go out there and try to do something that no one else has done around you, and it can be anything. It can be 
losing weight or getting a different job or, or going to college or moving away from your town or whatever. But as soon as you start to spread your wings, you know, people around you are going to try to hold you back. And, and the crab bucket mentality kind of states like, if you put one crab in a bucket next to the sea, that crab's going to be able to crawl out of that bucket and go back to the sea. But if you put multiple crabs in that bucket, if one crab tries to crawl out of that bucket, the other crabs will latch onto it and pull it back down. And if that crab continues to persist to try to get out of the bucket, the crabs will bring it down and break its legs. And if it continues to strive to get out of there, the crabs will eventually end up killing it. And uh, I liken this to- That's you know, real life. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I knew my family, some of my family, I mean, some of my family love the book. Some of my family are, are so supportive, but I got three or four cousins out there that are calling me, you know, everything they can, you know, lies and this and that. And why and do you think it stems from shame? I think, I think some of it is, is, you know, here's this guy, he doesn't live in this small town anymore. He doesn't and he's get it anymore. He's better yeah, he, than us. Yeah, exactly. He's bringing up these things and now we have to deal with it again. And I, you know what, when it, it all comes down to, I think also is it's, you know, jealousy. I, I hate to say that. I, I, I want to give yeah, him the benefit I of the agree. doubt, but I think a lot of it comes down to jealousy. Here's this guy who has had some success in his life. And because his shine is brighter, somehow they look, mm -hmm. it's dulling their shine. And that couldn't be any further from, from the truth. I love my family. I wish them the best. And anything that I could, could do or can do to help them, I want to do that. I mean, the whole purpose of this book is to let people know that no matter what circumstances you're born in, you're not a victim of those circumstances. You're a product of those choices. But I think in the crab bucket mentality is that it's a lot easier to tear things down than it is to build things up. There's two ways to have the tallest building in the city. You can either build the tallest building, which takes a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort, or you can uh, tear down all the buildings that are higher than your building is. And I think some people take that easy route. It's easy to get on social media and try to tear people down and discredit people. But at the end of the day, why are you focusing on somebody else's success? Like get to work on your own success. Like don't worry about that because I got news for you. Those people that uh, you're trying to tear down, they're not thinking about you. They're Never. thinking about their own success while you're focused on their success. And it's harder, though, when it's your family. At the end of the day, this is your story. You're allowed to do whatever you want with it. You experienced it. Yeah. Well, and you know what? A lot of times it is your family or your close friends mm -hmm. because, you, you know, think about it. If, if somebody wins $500 million on TV, you're going to be like, oh, good for them, you know. Mm -hmm. But then let somebody in your family or a close friend win 500 <laughs> million bucks. And then how do you feel? Are, are you as happy for them? You're jealous. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of times you're not. A lot of times you're jealous and it's human nature, but yeah. it, it's very destructive. I mean, it, it, I, I feel sorry for any haters out there or anybody who doesn't have that sense of abundance. Yeah. This universe has more than enough to go around. If you want to be successful, whatever it is, health, money, mm -hmm. relationships, there's enough out there for anybody who's willing to go for it. You don't have to worry about somebody else's success taking away from your success. Because at the end of the day, the only person you're competing against is that version of yourself that you are today and uh, striving to become that better version tomorrow, next month, next year. I want to talk about a few more points of your childhood. And then I definitely want to ask you about your experience in business and everything after that. Another thing you mentioned is you lived in eight different places before you were 12, like eight households. Yeah. Well, how did that affect eight, eight oh. different homes? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, how does that affect you? Like, it, it was, you know what? I, at, at this time of my life, you just thought that's the way it was. I mean, a lot right. of times it was from lack of payment of rent. Sometimes right. it was because, you know, my, the fighting my father would come home at two 30 and when the bars closed and they'd get into fights. And a lot of the homes that we lived in were triplexes yeah. or duplexes. And so, you know, the cops would come and then the landlord would, 
you know, eventually throw you out because the neighbors complain so much. Did you understand what was happening as a kid? Sort of. I mean, I knew we moved a lot. I don't know if I fully comprehended why we moved so much, right. but a lot of times we would move to where you didn't even need a truck. You know, there was a house up the street yeah. that was for rent and we were carrying couches up the road, you know, <laughs> hundred yards to our, to our next house. So yeah, we were doing that. And, and in fact, I draw motivation from this. I have a photo mm. of one of my first houses that we lived in, and it's a converted garage that can't be more than four or 500 feet. And it's on my office wall to inspire and motivate me to help other people. Keep you humble? Move. Oh, yeah. I mean, it absolutely yeah. keeps me humble, but it also inspires me to get out there and spread my message mm. uh, to help other people who I know are even in worse situations. Uh, than I was. Mm. You must have been, I feel like throughout your stories, the adults when you were in junior high and high school, it was either two ways. I felt like, well, the girls you were dating, your girlfriends, their parents didn't want them dating you, did they? Oh, absolutely not. No. I, I, there was a couple of times where the parents would be like, do you know who that is? That's a Tressler. Like, you're not allowed to be around them. But the girls took a, a taking to you still. Yeah, I'm a handsome guy. <laughs> you had no trouble getting the girls. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know how to say that. Yeah, I, I had some girlfriends back then, and you know, I eventually had a, a long-term girlfriend that I talk about in my book. Yeah, and uh, you know, once they got to know me, and you know, I, I think they kind of loosened up a little bit and realized I wasn't the boogeyman. But you know, I, I, I don't think I was anybody's uh, first choice for their daughter in high no. school. You know, no matter what my last name was, I wasn't this stellar, respectful youth who was out there doing all the right things by any means. But then on the flip side, I remember a story that you told where one of the adults wanted you to work at their company with their son yeah. to give their son a better example of hard work and dedication. They, they thought their, their own son was a little too privileged for his own being. Did yeah, you realize so, that was what was happening at the time? Yeah, no. Yeah, he told me that. And the a couple, father did. Yeah, the father, when he pulled me aside. A couple of my uncles worked for his construction company. Okay. and You're in high school at this time, right? Like grade 11, grade 12? Yeah. 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 And a couple of my, you know, a couple of my uncles worked for him at his construction company. His son played football with me. Mm. I was a pretty good athlete. That's kind of where I took out a lot of the aggression in yes. my life. And uh, so I was always hustling and I have a story about my number and, and all that stuff and where I kind of got that drive from. But he saw that and he knew our situation. He knew my family. And I think, you know, his son was pretty privileged in sports car, you know, that that typical, you Silver know, really, spoon. yeah, really wealthy. And I think he wanted uh, him to rub shoulders with somebody who had it rough and was out there on that football field giving it his all because he knew that was all that he had. And I think his son kind of was like, eh, yeah, you know what? I, I get to drive my sports car home to my million dollar house and anything oh. that I want I get. And I think he wanted him to be exposed to that contrast that I talked about. Yeah. The opposite contrast. Exactly. It's interesting that you need to each side, the privilege and the underprivileged need to see each other's life to really gain perspective. And you mentioned that this this kid's name was named Scott, right? Yep. Yeah. This kid, Scott, I don't think he realized there was parts of his town that were living the way you were. Oh, no, no. I mean, like I said, he's living in so a unaware. Yeah. And you know what? I think that you, you, you touch on something that I think is a problem in our society right now is with social media. We're pretty much around people who think the same way that we do. Yeah. Fair. All the algorithms push us towards people who feel this the same Good way point. that we feel on politics or health or all that. So we're kind of in this bubble and we don't realize that there's a different point we're of in view. An echo out chamber. There. Right. You either watch this news channel or you watch this news channel, and now you don't get to see the other side of things. And I think that's what contrast does for you. I love those stories where the Muslim and the Jew spent a year or two together. When, it, when they started, they hated each other. And when they left, they loved each other. because and they probably they got, realized they have all the same values. Exactly. They got to mm -hmm. spend that time and see that contrast and see the other point of view. I, I, I think we're really missing out on that. And I think 
if we were able to kind of do that and spend some time with somebody who has a different point of view, one, we'd see their point of view and maybe we'd come a little closer to the middle and they'd come a little closer to the middle. And I think that's what this world's missing right now. Mm, great point. And especially like you said, um, with the algorithms, if we like something because they make money, if we keep liking, they're going to keep sending us the things we already like. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. I never thought about it that way. One last question I have for during your childhood, a little bit of a more happier side. Uh, you speak really fondly of your grandmother. She was a big part of your life. She took care of you from 12 years old onwards. Do you have any funny memories or fond memories of her that you didn't talk about in the book? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, you just gave me chills just by mentioning her. She's still alive? No, she died about five or six years ago mm. at, at, at almost 90. 2015? So, yeah. I lost my great grandmother the same year and she is a force. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those, those guys grew up in such a different era. And again, I mean, my mom's a, the hero of the story. My gram could be the hero of the story. Nelson, was... your grandmother visited your grandfather in prison for 40 years. Every month. Every month for 40 years. And it, there was no, like, he did what he did and she knew it, but she still had that loyalty. That blows my mind. And she knew he was never getting out. He never had the possibility mm -hmm. of parole. So, yeah. And, and she was dedicated to her family. And like I said, when I went to go live with my gram, my gram had 15 children. A few of them were still living there when I moved in. Wow. But she was also raising five other cousins for various reasons in this house. So, and that, you know, that didn't account for, you know, the occasional cousin that just wanted to stay at Graham's and, and be there. At, this place you know, is a circus at all times. Oh yeah. There, there was always there, but my Graham, she, she didn't know how to cook for anything less than an army. I mean, the, the pot that she cooked would feed, you know, 50 people. And that's just <laughs> how she learned how to cook having 15 kids. Mm. And she cooked that way every day of her life. And she'd just have a big pot of whatever. And everybody would just come and eat at her house and no one went hungry who lived close to her. And everybody, e even people who weren't related to us called her Graham. And uh, you know what? I, I, it's just, I can't imagine too many better people who've ever lived on this earth than my Graham. And like we say, this, the book that you wrote, you're the main character, but it's also your mom. But then you also, you don't know the life that your grandmother led before and kind of what she was experiencing throughout everything. Yeah. And, and I could write a story on her. I mean, yeah. she had it hard with, with my grandfather. She had it hard in her family, grew right. up during the great depression, you know, very, very poor, mm -hmm. had her first kid, I think at 17 or 18 years old yep. and had 15 of them in, in a two bedroom house. Oh my God. So yeah, no, my, where are they, where's everyone going? But it, that, those were the times, right? Well, that's, that's, that's what I joke about is like, I can figure out how you fit 15 kids in a house, but how do you make 15 kids in a two bedroom house? It just, you know, that gives me a headache even thinking about it, but. I know. Well, you have three of your own and that's a headache enough most days. Yeah. yeah. Good, good and bad. I want to switch gears and talk about more the, your businesses and your commercial real estate career, owning daycares, owning doggy daycares. I love what you said, the correlation you made where you always manage to get into business of taking care of something. I love that correlation because yeah, at eight years old, you were taking care of three babies and then you end up investing in businesses that took care of dogs and took care of young children. But you start off the story. If you want to get into a bit of that, you start off your book talking about what happened on the news that day, if you want to talk to that. Yeah. So, I mean, my book opens up, I, I get involved in these children's daycare centers. Our operation partner embezzles a million dollars from me and my father-in-law. And it's during the great recession. Everything is about to implode, including these six daycares that we own that we've invested millions of dollars in. My father-in-law is going through kidney failure at the time, and he's going to lose the ability to practice as a dentist. And he's invested pretty much his life savings in this business that's going to just evaporate. So eventually we get in there and we take these businesses over. I have no clue how to run a business. I've never operated a business. I've been invested in, in them. And, but 
anyhow, we jump in there and a few years into running them, I end up hiring a man to run one of my children's daycare centers against my uh, gut feeling. And men have a target on their backs in children's daycares. No one trusts them with their kids. And, you know, it, it's not good for them and it's not good for the parents and it's really not good for the business. But this yeah. guy had worked in the industry for 10 years. He'd worked for a national firm who had locations in Las Vegas. He came highly recommended. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if I got lazy or what, but I ended up hiring him and he blew me away. He was awesome. Well, he was a referral. Yeah. Yeah. And you, he you have your right hand man being like, this is the person to run this. Yeah. And a few years after hiring him, I don't know if there's any uh, a worse nightmare when you own a children's daycare center than to turn on the news and see your daycare director there and underneath him accused child molester running a children's daycare center in Las Vegas. And that's the point where I realized you actually can lose the ability to stand when you see something traumatic like that. That's how my book opens up. It's during the Great Recession and just figuring out how to get through all that and make it through. Yeah, it's 2008. You're a commercial real estate broker by trade, by career. So yeah, that's the worst industry to be in, in 08. It was interesting hearing the story of you calling the banks and the banks are like, like, we can't loan you anything. Like we're going into business. It's, yeah. We're in a recession. And then owning daycare centers and owning doggy daycare centers. Yeah, people aren't spending their money there. Yeah, it wasn't in a like- a tough position. Yeah, it wasn't like I was in the commodity business and anything. Oh, I mean, everything literally was- Literally nothing. Yeah, dependent on- you know, people having discretionary income yes. and being willing to travel and having a job and being willing to invest. And none of that was happening from 08 to, you know, 11, maybe, yeah. maybe it started to loosen up a little bit then, but, and Vegas was one of those cities that was probably hit the hardest yeah. because, you know, we're all about tourism and nobody was taking and trips. discretionary spending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it was, it was definitely that perfect storm. It was, some of the scariest times in my life and and that flooded over into my personal life mm -hmm. and and everything. So yeah, I, I don't want I don't want to go through that again. Nelson, I mean this with a lot of empathy. I am so surprised you didn't have a heart attack during that time. I can only imagine the amount of stress that you're under. You well, you were a commercial real estate broker, so you probably live a pretty luxe life. You said you had a pool and a sport court like in your house. Your way of life isn't cheap at that time. You have three boys that were play professional sports and it's a pretty expensive lifestyle. And then all of that being taken away pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, in, in 2007, I was number one in the world for a top five commercial real estate firm. Uh, That's a huge achievement. And, yeah. And had been doing well. And it's just kind of like, you know, you you remember that hand of cards that you get dealt? Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to just push my hand out on the table and just say, there it is, man. <laughs> like I'm winning it all. all. <laughs> yep. And, you know, life has a way of uh, saying, nope, you're going to reshuffle that hand. And that's what you it You had did. such a winning hand. Oh, yeah. And, and that's what happened with the recession was, okay, time to throw that hand in and we're going to deal you, you know, a lot of twos and a lot of threes and good luck making a good hand out of this. Yeah. That, that was the hand I was dealt back then. You were given nothing short of a few miracles during that time to really get you back up and running. The and I don't want to give all the story away. Everyone should go read your book. But yeah, there is there's a few things that happened that really got you in line. Yeah. And obviously the economy got a little better, but you knew that you're a businessman. You knew the economy was gonna come back, but you can you can see that in the in the horizon, but it's not happening anytime soon, I'm sure, as you're experiencing it all. Well, and and that's the one thing I think that really helped me was I, I definitely got depressed. I definitely went to a dark place for a long time and yeah. You had marriage problems for most oh, yeah. of the time too. Yeah, yeah. Everything was everything was falling apart. And, you know, I got to the point where none of this is my fault, you know, mm -hmm. and coming from my childhood, dealing with everybody else's mistakes back then too. And I, I got into that victim mindset for a while there. And that's why I, I kind of put that victim mindset on my book. But eventually though, you know, I tell the story about going to one of my children's daycare centers. And there's this poor, sweet mom and, and I get emotional just telling this story, but 
she's there with uh, three kids and you, you can tell the kids are giving her trouble and she's trying to get them out of a car and she's struggling. And all of a sudden, one of the toddlers breaks for the door as a car is driving through the parking lot. And this poor mother, fortunately, and the car missed the kid, but it slapped me in the face. Like, here I am. I'm living in a beautiful house. I still have my family. I'm worried about saving chains of businesses. And this poor mom, I come to find out her husband had died over a drug overdose. And she has these three kids and she's just trying to get by. And that's when I started to just really take a step back and say, you know what, no matter where you are in life, there's somebody that would kill to be in this situation. And that's when I just started to focus on the things that I could focus on and uh, realize how truly blessed I was to have the problems that I was having. And I think as soon as I took that control, as soon as I took 100% control over my success, that put me back into control. And then I realized I can change this. And, you know, no matter what happens, it's going to happen, but I'm still in control. And, and eventually things will work their way out. It, it might not be pretty in the short term, but, you know, hopefully I have a long life ahead of me and I can work through it and get through it with my experiences and, and determination. I mean, talking about perspective and contrast there, you were on the other side of it this time, though. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you I, talk a lot about how much you changed with one generation of Tresslers. And this is this is such a, a poetic part of your story, but you ended up having three boys that can pass on your name, but this time it's going to be passed on with a lot of respect and dignity. Yeah, and you absolutely. changed that in one generation just with your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I talk about that. You know, I have a great friend. And he's in from a small little town outside of Vegas. So everybody knows that name, his last name in this small town. And every time he brings it up and, and says where he's from, they ask him if he knows his father who had passed away from cancer. Mm -hmm. But because of the life that that guy had lived, everybody has a story of how great that man was. And, you know, I think about that, like, oh my goodness, like there is not a better legacy than to let behind a name that is synonymous with, you know, respect and honor and all those things. And that has me thinking about my last name and what I'm going to pass on to my boys, because my boys are going to have that last name. And, you know, I never want them to hear a story where I didn't do the right thing. I didn't do what I said I was going to do, or I wasn't truthful or whatever, because there is nothing that is worth my boys ever hearing a story of that because of what their last name was. I went through that every time I said my last name growing up and I never want that for my family and their eventual family. And from what you say of your boys, they're pretty successful so far. They're ages 17 to 22. Yeah. Uh, 15, 15 to 15. 20. My son's birthday's today. Oh, happy birthday to your son. Well, what what yeah. are you on here? Where are they? <laughs> He's at work. He's the 23-year-old. Oh, he's on a mission like with missionary right now. The or no, not anymore. One, the middle one is. Oh, okay. So my 23-year-old is actually getting married next week. It's his birthday today. So he's getting married next week. My 18-year-old is out serving a mission for our church. And he's put on a Division I uh, scholarship on hold to go do that for two years. For baseball. Then, yeah, for baseball. Yeah. And then uh, my 15-year-old is a freshman, and it looks like they're headed back to school sometime uh, in March. So cool. he's excited to do that. So yeah, no, I mean, uh, just to have these boys be the type of boys that they are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they're so much better than I was. And I don't and, know about that. And, maybe better off. Well, <laughs> no, they're, they're better people. Really? Uh, they really are. And, you know, they, they have a great mom that teaches them all those great things. but. No. And, and that's exactly what I want. Like, I want those generations to get better right. and not worse. I, I want them to look and say, you know what? Not on my watch did this line of trustlers go mm -hmm. down. And I think we all have that ability. If we could be stuck in that cycle, no matter where we're at, but we can always stop that cycle or definitely slow it down. But if we feel like we're stuck somewhere, I mean, look where I came from, mm -hmm. you know, and now here, here we are, you know, my son, who's 18 years old, has a division one baseball scholarship. He's serving a mission 
my mom was 18 years old. You know, she had a kid that was three years old and dealing with everything that she did. And now just one generation later, and it really started with one goal. It started with that one goal to become the first person in my family to graduate from college. And that's the great thing about goals is Mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't just change that person. It changes generations. And because of that, my kids' lives are different and their kids' lives are going to be different and their kids' lives. So, I mean, that's the power that each one of us have. And you've also recently celebrated 25 years of marriage, right? Yeah. January, we went over 25 years. It was. Wow. It, you went through some rough times, but you made it. Well, that's what I said. It's It's been the best 17 years of my life because there were some rough years in there mm. and, and it only feels like five minutes right. under, underwater. But uh, I love that quote. <laughs> Your wife doesn't. He doesn't like that at all. (laughs) No, I mean, but as we said here today, I mean, we're more in love than we've ever been. And we figured out so many things that we didn't have figured out before. And that's my advice to anybody out there who's struggling too. I mean, the one thing I'm so glad if you read my book, you know that we were one or two or three harsh words away from not making it. And as I said here, you know, 10, 12, 15 years later, I look at all the memories and the experiences that we had together as a family that we wouldn't have had if we would have given up. And it was so worth it. I mean, it's, you know, as we're planning my son's wedding together and doing all those things together and talking to my son on his mission and going to my younger son's baseball games together, it's so worth it. And, you know, if we would have given up, we would have forfeited all of that that we have now. So you can figure it out and make it in most situations, I think. Well, you you said a few times in the book, the quote, and I, I, I think this to picture entire life, we control the sails of our own ship no matter which way the wind blows. And you've been holding on to those sails tight. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. We can't control the winds, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we can't control what's going on in the world. We can't even control what, the people surrounding us are doing, but what we're we thinking can, or yeah. saying, yeah. But what we can control is how we respond to it. And that's the life that you're going to get. You're going to have what happens, but then what really matters is how you respond to it. And you're our 100% in control of how you respond to all those things that happen. You want to speak to a little bit about what you're up to now with your company, I Got Smarter? Yeah. So you know, I, I was able to exit a lot of those businesses that we just talked about, and I was figuring out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I was reflecting, like, why did I live this life that I lived? And it came to me that I need to share my story to help other people realize that they're not victims of their circumstances, but products of their choices. And I looked at how important goals were in my life, specifically that first goal and the power that we're talking about with goals. And I literally became obsessed with goals and personal development for the last 25 years. And I saw the power of it. And I sat down and for two years or three years, wrote this program that I kind of patched all the holes where I struggled achieving my goals and where I saw other people struggle. And I put it all in a program called I Got Smarter. And then I went and designed an app to make it so easy to use because you know, when things are hard to use, you don't use them. So I, I did that. And now that's out there. And, you know, I want as many people uh, who want to live that life that they've been dreaming of to use this program, because it will help them eventually do that. And you said that a lot of wives are happy with their husbands doing your program. (laughs) Well, Well, so early on, I became known as that goal guy. You know, I was always talking about goals and I would ask people, you know, what are your goals? Like, you know, when somebody would complain to me or somebody would say something wasn't right, I I always likened it back to goals because I think that's a lot of problems is we're just going through life without any direction and goals give you that direction. And so eventually I started to become people's accountability partners. They check in with me. I check in with them. And I saw a huge difference, not only in their lives and their goal achievement, but in mine, even though I thought, well, geez, I'm doing a great job on my goals. But as soon as I realized, holy crap, I need to talk to Bill about what I did today. I actually have to get that done. I can't slack on it. And I realized how powerful that was. 
And then it got to be too much. I, I mean, I wasn't charging for this. I was just helping people out. And so eventually I said, let's get a group together who want to achieve goals. And so I got 12 people together. I kind of wrote a little program and we all became each other's accountability partners. Two people would be accountability partners and we'd rotate every month. And I just saw a huge, you know, change in people. And this was people in every asset of life. I mean, we had surgeons and lawyers and business owners, and there were a few people who were out of work in, in construction. And so no matter what field you were in, everybody did a lot better. And I would bump into people's wives who husbands were in this group and they'd be like, Nelson, you can never stop this group. My husband is a different man. You know, he's thoughtful. He picks up after himself. You know, he even uh, puts the toilet seat down and they're like, don't you ever stop this? And that's when I realized like these were great men anyhow, and their wives are seeing a difference. And then eventually a few years into the, the, the wives seeing their husbands, all the wives whose husbands were in this group, they started their own goal group and because right. they saw the benefit of it. And that was the idea of, I got smarter. That's where I realized that the world needed something like this. And we always talked about, man, it would be cool if we had this or this technology. And that's where I designed all that stuff into the app to help people with their success partners and with the groups and all the tools, the knowledge and support that people need. Did you trust your intuition a little bit more when hiring people this time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I still have made bad hires. Uh, right. um, you know, I think we all do, but uh, intuition is real. Hey. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I would never suggest anybody going against their gut. I know. I know. We still do, though. We do. I know. But, uh, and you've built the business pretty successfully. You mentioned a lot of passive income coming in. It's a pretty successful business so far. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got a lot of real estate still that, that helps right. me. Commercial you know, or residential? Still commercial? Yeah, all commercial. All through uh, Vegas or other places? Vegas and uh, Arizona. Nice. Yeah. And but you don't you don't make any money off the businesses. You're just the landlord now. Correct. I love right. that. Yeah, I don't have to deal. I mean, and and you know what? We were in tough businesses. Like they're yeah. so volatile. Well, I can't even imagine if we didn't sell it and uh, we still own uh, doggy daycares through COVID. Can you imagine going through this again? Going through it once doesn't make you any more equipped. No. You have no control over any of it. You know, the one thing I learned was to not have debt from the first time. I mean, right. if you get out of debt, you're going to have a lot better chance of making it through some of these horrible things, you know, that happen. And because debt never sleeps. And, you know, I came really, really close to having to go bankrupt during that. So 08. close. Yeah. So. You flooded I, all of your money into them yeah. to keep them afloat because you cared a lot more about the employees keeping their jobs as opposed to you bringing oh. a paycheck. Oh, yeah. I mean, not a lot of people care about that. Well, when you have a business, the, the first thing you need to realize is your employees are your most important asset. And if you don't realize that, you're probably not going to be successful or definitely not as successful as you could be. Mm, I mean, I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. So, I mean, I was still doing commercial real estate. So you took your brother-in-law and threw him into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good story. And he seems really that. sweet. He is. Yeah. He's mm. probably one of the best guys I, I know. So yeah. It, and, and that's the thing I realized too, is it's, it's a matter of the people that you surround yourself with. Mm. I'm I'm not very good at, too many things. So I just have to surround myself with people who are awesome. And then I, I kind of get out of their way and let them do what I know they can do. Mm. Since you're the goal guy, what goals do you have coming up? Especially, well, you're, you just launched your book in November, right? Yeah, just launched in November. I want to lose 10 pounds because I'm going to Hawaii in a month. Another goal, you know, surrounding the I Got Smarter. Mm -hmm. I want to get that out there to as many people as I can because I know how it's going to change people's lives. And so I'm looking to do that and, and expose that. And my book, you know, I, I have some goals surrounding that book. I think that book will motivate and inspire people to take control of their own lives. So those are the three goals that I have this four week sprint. Sorry, what? That's just the next four weeks. Yeah. So I got smarter teaches you how to take these huge goals and to break okay. them down into bite-sized pieces because then that urgency is there, you know, exactly where right. you want to go and it's four weeks away. So I set all of my goals based on a four-week sprint, and then I set milestones. 
So I know I'm going to hit those goals. So with the book, is there PR goals right now? Probably. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm trying to ex- kind of get it out as much as possible. Yeah. I like being yeah. on, you know, great podcasts like mm-hmm. yours and, and people hearing the story and wanting to get out there and read it and learn it and be inspired. Right. Very cool. Nelson, to start closing it all out, do you have any last minute words of advice or any stories that you'd want to tell or any last parting words? Yeah, I, I listen to podcasts. I love podcasts. And you know what? I get fired up and I get uh, inspired. And hopefully your listeners have done the same thing. What I would suggest is start now. You know, whatever's going on in your mind, whatever you're thinking about that you need to do, start now and start where you're at. I think there's so many people that don't do that and they want to wait for next week or next month or next New Year's, heaven forbid. But start now because the lights are never going to be all green. You know, whenever you're starting on these goals, it's like walking through fog. You know, you can't see that entire landscape until you take a step and then a little bit more is opened up to you and, and you take another step and a little bit more. So just start taking those steps and start today and start where you're at. And to anyone that maybe had a similar upbringing as you and maybe has not seen the amount of success that you have, any words of encouragement for them? Yeah. I mean, if one of us can do it, all of us can do it. That's the one thing that I realized. I always felt like I was damaged goods. I felt like, you know, I wasn't as good as anybody because of my upbringing and because of where I came from. But as I kind of got out into the world, I realized a lot of these people who are successful aren't smarter than me. They don't have more talent than me. They just actually do the things that need to be done. And so just, you know, as quickly after becoming a dreamer, you need to become a doer and realizing that most people out there don't have any secret skills or they're not super smart. They're just willing to do it and consistently do it and do it until it's done. Yeah. Amen to that. Well, Nelson, thank you so much for your time. I will add your the link to your book in the show notes for everyone to read. I bought it on Kindle and it was very affordable. I think I paid under $10 Canadian, I think, if I recall. Yeah. It was a quick read. I went through it pretty quickly and it was fantastic. I didn't want to touch on too many stories, Diggs. We'll basically retell the whole book, but there's a lot of good stories that really touched me and I didn't even speak to them today. But I want to thank you for your time. I want to wish your son a happy wedding. I want to wish you a happy belated anniversary. you got a, you got a lot of cool things coming up in your life and a Hawaii trip up and coming. So life looks good for you, Nelson. Life's good. Life's good. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate it.